Shadow of the Eartree is taking a long time to come out, so I've taken on the mission to beat the game as all of Elden Ring's NPCs. The goal is to make a tier list, to measure these builds by how powerful they are, and how fun they are to play as. These runs are called cosplay runs, and I'm trying to find which ones are the best for you guys to play as while we wait for this future DLC. These runs help others find new builds and ways to replay the game, and today's pick is Jaren. The rules are simple, I can only use Jaren's equipment, I must complete his questline, and I cannot summon. Based off the wiki, Jaren wields a flamberge with the flaming strike ash war and a carrying glint blade staff, which he uses to cast magic glint blade. That's all there is to say, so let's jump right into the run. After I made an exact replica of Jaren's character model, I selected the Prisoner's class. This class starts off with Magic Glint Blade, which is the only spell that Jaren uses. And on top of this, it also has stat points in Intelligence, Strength, and Dexterity, which are the three main stats I need to level up to use Jaren's equipment. I died to the tutorial boss, woke up in Limgrave, and got my horse. After this, I exhausted Rodrika's dialogue for a free golden seed later on, and then started Alexander's questline, because he's part of the festival. I grabbed some stones in two locations in Stormhill, and used a nearby giant to break a statue containing even more. Both of Jaren's weapons use normal smithing stones, so I'll be needing as many as I can get. Grabbed the sleep pot cookbook, my flask, and headed to Kaled. Here I can get my hands on one of the best early game talisman, the Dragon Crest Shield. I can then take a long route to get closer to the Radon Festival. First, cross the Knight's Cav Bridge and use the Spirit Jump. Then pass Fort Faroth and use another Spirit Jump. After crossing the Church of the Plague, you can jump on a nearby building in Celia. From here it's a short distance to Redmain Castle, where the festival will be held. After getting all the upgrade materials in the Weeping Peninsula, I went back to Kaled and cheesed the Knight's Cavalry. These runes let me level up to meet all the requirements for Terran's tools, and I was able to pump the leftover currency into health and endurance. At this point, I've done all I can in Limgrave and Kaled for now, so I headed to Lucaria. There's a lot of smithing stones too, twos, and some threes scattered all throughout this place, so I collected those first. More importantly though, I can also get my staff. I kicked the guard off the roof, and then looted the corpse containing the carrying glint blade staff. A major character involved in Jaren's questline is Selen. In fact, it's impossible to progress Jaren's questline without progressing hers. So, before doing any task revolving around Jaren, I thought it'd be best to start Selen's questline. This required me to be the Mad Pumpkin head boss, but fortunately that was really easy with Magic Glint Blade. I just casted the spell and kept my distance until it fired. I'm not much of a sorcery fan, but this is a neat spell, as it charges up a magical dagger to flee at enemies. With him dead, I have full access to any conversation with Selen. Now there's another thing to discuss here. Activating the Radon Festival. The festival is located in Redmain Castle. This castle has two separate modes in the story. The first mode being a normal castle full of enemies trying to kill you, and a boss fight. The second mode is just the festival. At this point of the story, the castle is in its normal state. In order to change that, I must progress Rani's questline or activate a Grace in Altus. However, I didn't want to start the festival. Not yet, at least. This is because there's an optional part of Jaren's questline containing a bit of dialogue. Unfortunately, this is behind the Misbegotten Warrior and Crucible Knight duo boss fight. Although this step is so unnecessary, part of the series is showcasing all parts of the given character's questline, so I gotta fight them. Unlike my fight with the Mad Pumpkinhead, I grabbed the Flamberge Sword and the Ash of War that Jaren uses alongside it. Flaming Strike. Both of these items are located in Redmain Castle, the Sword on a Corpse, and the Ash of War on a Scarab. And man, after this run, this weapon combo has become one of my favorite combos in the entire game. Let me explain. I recently beat Elden Ring without dying a single time. In fact, I finished the run on the day I'm writing the script. During the run, I used this weapon combo. It's a great balance of fun and powerful, but not too powerful. It's not gonna wipe out bosses like Magic or Rivers of Blood, which makes me like it even more. It still takes skill to use, but it's really good. Flaming Flamberge has bleed, and usually I don't typically like greatswords, but I have fun with this one. It's got decent range, and it's good with pierce and standard damage. Adding flaming strike with the fire infinity makes it even better in my opinion. Hitting L2 will make your character's left hand throw fire at the opponent, which then can be followed by an R2 swing that catches the blade on fire. With magic glint blade as well, I can confidently say Jaren has a really fun build to play with. Considering I had upgraded my carrion staff, I got the smithing 1 and 2 bell bearing to upgrade the flamberge. Since this weapon has bleed, I can also kill grail to get lots of runes. Before doing this though, I killed patches to get three foul feet and the foul foot crafting book. I collected lots of materials to create enough of these feet to have one for each boss fight during this run. With Grail dead, I leveled up and easily killed the putrid tree avatar to get the damage reducing teardrop. This weapon combo made the first part of this fight really easy. The misbegotten warrior can easily be staggered, so after getting my first repost, I caught him in a stagger loop. With him dead, the only real challenge is the crucible knight. Rather than relying on my sword like I did with the misbegotten warrior, I used magic glint blade instead. 
At first the spell kept getting blocked by the knight's shield, but I later found out that I should just cast it before the boss ran up to me. This would place the spell behind the enemy, making it hit his weak point rather than his shield. After killing the boss, I'm rewarded with some dialogue with Jaren, who basically just talks about the upcoming festival. Now that this step is done, I have access to Altus, so I looted everything I could there, including the smithing 3 and 4 bell bearing. I also killed another putrid tree avatar for the fire damage teardrop. This was a major boost to my damage, at least whenever my sword was caught on fire. I also grabbed the green turtle talisman and the pearl drake talisman. Now there's just a bit more to do with Selen before I can progress Jiren's questline. I needed to get two legendary sorceries, the first one being Comet Azor in Mount Glumir, and the second being Stars of Rune in Kaelid. Both of these are pretty easy to get and do not require any boss fights. After showing these to Selen, her questline will progress to the part where Jiren becomes involved, but his NPC is stuck at the Radon festival right now. With that in mind, I figured it would be a good idea to kill Radon. After speaking to Jiren to start the festival, I began summoning everyone. Even though it could be argued that I'm allowed to only summon Jiren, let's keep in mind that Jiren is the former best friend of Radon and organizer of the festival, so I summoned everyone. It's neat thinking Jiren put this whole thing together just to give his friend an honorable death, and honestly, even though I'm still studying the lore, I'm easily siding with Jiren instead of Selen. Even though it's probably a better idea to stay back and cast Magic Glint Blade, it seemed much more fun to jump right into the chaos with all the other NPCs. During the second phase, Jiren's summoning sign will finally appear. Even though this was one of my sloppier fights with this boss, I had a great time fighting alongside these characters. With Radon dead, the festival finally ends. This progresses both Jiren and Selen's questline, which now merge into one. First, Selen has a request to go to her real body and collect its soul. Real body, in Limgrave, is found imprisoned in some ruins. After taking her soul, I went back to Redmayne Castle to find Jiren gone. This is because he goes to the same spot where Selen's body is and kills her, completely unaware of the fact that I'm carrying her soul. I exhausted his dialogue and then made my way to Carrion Manor. I have to kill the spirit version of Loretta to get to Selvis's dungeon, but luckily that's really easy. Here you can find multiple corpses being turned into puppets, and honestly this is one of the most disturbing lore related places in the game. The good news is that you can use one of these puppets as a vessel for Selen's soul. Now that Jiren and Selen's quest lines have progressed this far, they will both enter an arena to fight. Unfortunately, this arena is in the Rhea Lucaria library, meaning I have to kill Renala to make this fight happen. And to kill Renala, I have to kill the Red Wolf guarding her chambers. With all the runes I've collected from Radon and his remembrance, I become way too powerful powerful for this fight, and it was over in under a minute. I do want to point out that you can actually summon Selen for this fight, but I'm cosplaying as Jiren, and he would never work with her, so I didn't use the summoning sign. During Renala's fight, I discovered I was so overleveled for this part of the game that I beat her first phase in one cycle. Her second phase is really easy and straightforward as well, so in order to not waste anyone's time, I'll just skip through this. Now that Renala is dead, two signs can be found outside her arena. One sign will make the player fight alongside Selen to kill Jiren, and the other will make the player fight alongside Jiren to kill Selen. Obviously, this is a Jaren cosplay run where I need to complete Jaren's questline, so I sided with him. Though, to be completely honest, I probably would have chosen his side even if I had a choice. Selen has done some really terrible things to other sorcerers, so after a short fight, Jaren and I took her out. This is where Jaren's questline ends kind of. Looking at his dialogue here, and considering he's one of the few surviving characters in Elden Ring, I'm very confident he'll appear in the future DLC. If you guys are starting a new save file in preparation for Shadow of the Erdtree, I would complete this questline, alongside Patches, Tanith, and a few others. But I'll be making a video on this in the future. Jiren ends his dialogue by giving us an ancient dragon smithing stone, which I used later on in the run. Now, this is where I have to do something very awkward. In order to achieve Jiren's full build, I need his armor set, but the only way to get that is to kill him. So, although I wouldn't recommend doing this, I quickly took him out for this run and equipped his armor. Now I have officially acquired the entire build that Jiren uses, and all that's left to do is finish the game. First thing I did was kill the Draconic Tree Sentinel. I activated a glint blade and then charged an R2 attack. This staggered him immediately, and it wasn't long before his phase transition. This is one of those fights where I wouldn't usually prefer a greatsword because of its slower attack speed. However, I had many opportunities to use my carrion staff instead. Besides the misbegotten and crucible knight duo, I killed every single boss in this run of my first try so I can easily say that this fight went pretty well. I'm not sure why, but this was at the point where I realized I hadn't killed Godric yet. Although both Margit and Godric weren't required for me to beat, they still had very useful drops, such as a talisman pouch and Godric's great rune. This part of the game really has nothing to do with Jaren, and since I'm so overleveled, I thought I'd just skip over this as well. Now in the capital, I have to fight the ghost version of Godfrey. I only got hit twice in this fight, so I'd say it went pretty well. His attacks are pretty easy to dodge as long as you remember his attacking patterns. After staggering him, it only took a few casts of magic limp blade to finish 
finish the fight. Before Morgoth, I realized I hadn't even taken advantage of Godric's Great Rune, so I made sure to activate that. Once again, this fight went really well. I think now's a good time to point out, it can be pretty challenging to make videos like this over and over again. It's come to the point where I've beaten this game with so many characters that I'm running out of things to talk about. I don't want to just keep repeating myself over and over again, and if I truthfully want to beat Elden Ring as every single NPC for this series, then I'll have to think of something creative. These videos also take hours and hours to make, and they don't end up doing insanely well, so if you guys have any suggestions, please let me know. I could live stream runs or just record with a live mic on. And if you guys prefer the way that I'm making these videos right now, or you'd rather see some changes, please let me know because I'm super open to many different ideas, as this content can get pretty repetitive and tiring to make. I will say I would have played around with many different mods in this channel, but I use a PS5 to make videos, which can't run modifications. But I'll definitely be updating this channel lots in the future. Anyways, let's get back to the run. I burnt the Ur tree with Melana and woke up in Fair Missoula. Godskin Duo went really well because both bosses behaved the exact same way. They fall asleep, I charge R2 three times, they get staggered, then I kill them. By repeating this pattern a few times, I was able to defeat the boss. This sword is really good. The only effect I wasn't seeing as often was its bleed buildup. Next up was Malekith, and I cannot explain why, but this guy used the double spin attack so many times, it was honestly hilarious. This fight wasn't even that long, but he managed to use it at least five times. I definitely started messing up towards the end, as you can see by the amount of flasks I have, but it didn't end up being an issue. Looking back, it would have been smart to use Magic Glib Blade. I used this much more on Beast Clergyman than I did on Malekith, and it's a pretty good spell, especially if you built a build revolving around magic and sorcery. Malekith down. Gideon's fight was hilarious in this run simply because I backed him into a corner and just kept swinging my sword in various ways. His monologue gave me time to cast magic and use my fire attack. He did manage to heal, but soon after I got bleed to proc, making the fight pretty much over. Godfrey is next, and instead of fighting this guy like I fought other bosses in this run, I decided to tank more and trade health. This eventually led to a stagger that nearly skipped the entirety of his second phase. For Alu, his third phase used to absolutely terrify me, but now I figured out how to find more openings mid-battle. Rather than using charged attacks like I did in the first phase, I now depended on jump attacks, simply because of how fast this guy attacks. Godfrey's jump move is mostly punishing, and although I didn't get bleed to proc or a stagger, my damage was powerful enough to kill him. Radagon is super weak to fire, making this fight a piece of cake. I benefited a lot from tanking some of his attacks because it led to him getting staggered twice. In my opinion, if you can skip Radagon's teleporting phase, you're very prepared to kill Elden Beast. Elden Beast, though, definitely isn't as weak to fire as Radagon is, but it's still a pretty good damage source to pick when fighting him. I know this guy's attacks very well, and it paid off here. I honestly had so much fun fighting as this character. If there had been an ending in this game to praise Radon or Gravity Magic, I would have easily chosen it for Jiren. Instead, I just became the Elden Lord and placed Jiren right back at his usual resting place. Now it's time to rank Jiren in the tier list that I'm working on that includes all the characters I've beaten Elden Ring as. As you can see, I've moved Nefeli down a bit after some further consideration, and I've placed Jaren very high in the list. This list measures not just how powerful these builds are, but also how much fun I had playing as them. We've had to wait a long time for this DLC, so if you need some run suggestions, here you go. Thank you all for watching this video, I really appreciate all the support this year. Right now I'm working on editing my Zero Death run, which I'm very excited about. At the same time, I'm also working on my Dark Souls 3 playthrough and my Liza P playthrough, so there's lots to look forward to in the future of this channel. Anyways, that's all for today. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next one.